Here we go. This is August week two for the community team. Uh, we got Charles starting us off for the demo. So this differs from uh, Christian's demo last week in that we are now using chunks instead of table writers, which is an important under the hood change, which is important for minimizing virtual calls. And we have improved our API. We support simple keys and values that are just the primitives that Kafka supports, JSON and Avro. And we are using stream tables, which are a new engine concept. So I am going to start off. I have a running Compose environment with Red Panda and the Apicurio schema service. And I will create a streaming table using the uh, quotes topic with a key column named symbol and a value column named price that is a double. We default to a string. So the first thing I'm going to do is publish a price for Microsoft from the command line. Then I'll switch over here and you saw it flicker into existence and then out of existence. I can do that again. And the reason this is happening is because the default way of presenting tables is a string table. And what a string table is defined to do is add new rows and then remove them on the next cycle. So you get one shot at seeing the data. So Ryan has updated our aggregations so that the aggregations that make sense on a string table will actually work on that string table and you don't need to maintain the whole table in memory. So now I'll publish a price again and it flickered out of the string table, but still exists in this aggregated last price table. And if I update my price again, we'll see it went into the simple table, flickered in and out, and then is persistent in the last by table. So what I'm going to do now is consume a JSON stream as a uh, table. So here, instead of specifying properties for the key column and value column, I'm just saying the value is JSON. There's a symbol that's a string, a side that's a string, a limit price that's a double, and a quantity that's an int. So what I'm going to do is publish an order, which is just a JSON string, as you can see. Mm -hmm. So symbol Microsoft, side by, limit price of 278.85, and a quantity of 200. And you saw that flicker in, or maybe you didn't see it flicker in, but it flickers in, it flickers out. You see that there's a different Kafka offset in those cases. Um, now, I can actually do things with a stream table. For example, I'm going to join my orders stream table that's on JSON with this aggregated last price table. And this will remain a stream table. So I'm going to publish an order again. And it flickers in, flickers out. But it's joining that last price data. And because it's a stream table and aggregations work, I can actually do more interesting things with it. So. Now I've created this total notional table, which is not a string table, but it's the result of a string table. And the string table aggregations start from uh, when you begin them, because the string table has no history. 
and I'll send another order. And we can see, all right, it's 200 and it has a notional value of $58,000. And if I send another order, then it increases. Um, they're keyed, so I can also um, send orders with a different key. And when I say key, this is actually just a Kafka value. The keys that you use for these aggregations are independent of what you specified as far as your Kafka ingestion um, orders. And you'll see that the notional price here is zero because at the time we had no price for buy. If I want to, I can publish a price for SPY. It'll show up in the last price because this is a streaming aggregation and I'm using the weight at the time the order was placed, it's still zero. But I could throw another order and now we'll have um, plenty of negative 200 with that one order's notional value. Um, So now I am going to switch to Avro. So the very first thing you need to do when you want Avro is you need to tell um, the schema service what the schema is. So we have an example that does that. And then I'm going to go back to ePaven. And I'm going to make a table from that Avro schema. And this is an append append only table instead of a streaming table and what that means is we're going to hold the entire history in memory so i've just published a uh, price of 420 here i'll publish a price of 440 and we have both of those prices and you can do whatever table operation you would like on that infinitely growing table. Um, obviously, you'll need to have enough memory to store the entire topic that you're trying to ingest, not just the current values. Um, and that is what we've done this week. Nice. OK. What else needs to be done for uh, Kafka then? So we also did error handling that needs to be plumbed to the UI. We need to do unit testing. And Christian is working on improving the Python API so that we can mix different types of serializers and deserializers more easily. So I gave you an example here with simple, with JSON and with Avro, but you could have an arbitrary cross product of those things. So for example, you could have a simple key that's an integer for security ID with an Avro value or a JSON value, but we're not processing those at this point. Um, <clears throat> is a streaming table a new native Deephaven concept or is it um, specific to Kafka right now? It's native to Deephaven. Their only implementation is Kafka. They're just query tables that we set an attribute on and we promise there will only ever be additions and removals, that there will be no modifications or shifts, and that every cycle you will get everything added and on the next cycle is removed. So you'll never have a row survive more than a single cycle, which is That's why cool. when we added things, they were disappearing immediately. And um, we support the aggregations that you would expect, like first and last, sums, averages, you know, basically any, anything that's numeric. What you can't do is you can't do a buy external. You can't do a buy, which would, because the buy would need to show you rows that don't exist, right? There's no history to these things. And um, you need to maintain the history. You can always convert a string table to an append only table. Um, and we've discussed the ability to allow you to window. So for example, keep the last hour of data or keep some number of rows of data, but that can just be built as a primitive on top later. Cool. 
All right. Any other questions for Charles? All right. Uh, I think uh, Amanda, you're up next. Yeah. So Thanks, what guys. I oh. Uh, what I have to share is the work of largely Ryan, but he's not here today, so he asked me to to demo it and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys see my terminals? Yep. Okay. Uh, much easier to read. <laughs> yeah, I, I try to zoom in for you. Um, so what you'll see here is I'm in the, the data directory of the, the Docker files and whatnot, and I have a few directories of information. Um, these are largely Parquet files, and so you'll see I have uh, this one directory that's areas, and when I go into that directory, direct your attention to the top right one, you'll see that there's nine different Parquet files, um, and they're all about two gigs. Um, breaking these Parquet files up into multiple files is really common. If you don't break this up, then the file is about 26 gigs, um, and so it's really useful to break it up. It's really common to actually have a directory more like this bottom right one, where we have 284 Parquet files in the directory. Um, so you get lots of files. And so what Ryan and Kristen, I believe, was able to do is, um, notice I have nothing loaded here. We are using the Parquet read table command. And rather than supplying a Parquet file, we're supplying just the directory path. And notice that one didn't work. Um, and that's because if we look at this directory, we'll see that there's this one file called bad file in it. Mm -hmm. So it knows there's not a parquet file. So if I supply a directory that has only parquet files of the same schema, then we magically get all of that data to load. And there it is. Um, three quarters of a million of data. Now, this one, the perm sorted station, it's not that big of data, it's 37 megs. But if we want to use one that's a little bit bigger, for example, that, that areas one, which is nine files, about 15 gigs in snappy compression, we can do the same thing. And even though it's you know 15 gigs, it loads pretty fast. And that's almost 370 million rows. Okay. So. All right, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else or uh, any questions for Amanda? That was a compelling demo. I like that. <laughs> uh, Devin, I think you're up. Great. Let me share a window here. All right. My demo this week's going to be some code examples along with some command line application and error handling. Um, can everybody see my IntelliJ window and read it? Uh, yep. Um, okay. Um, so. As we're progressing with the Java client, one thing we're trying to do is make the logic more generic uh, in how you operate with tables. Um, because if you're remote, you're, you're working with table handles. If you're on the server, you're actually working with tables. Um, if you're doing declarative QSTs, you're working with QSTs. Um, but using um, table creator and table operations, we're able to, in any of those formats, kind of express the same sort of logic. So you'll see right here, I've got some logic that does some time stuff. Um, and I've specifically annotated it with the number of operations. And you'll see why in a little bit. I'm doing some other time stuff here. Um, here's doing a join. Um, I've got a, a command line on my flag to specifically uh, create an error here. And we'll see uh, why we might want to do that in a little bit. Here's, here's something that modifies it. And then here's our final operation that kind of puts all this stuff together. Uh, and what we'll see here is we'll jump down to the command line here. And what we're going to do is we're going to run this in serial mode. Uh, so that means kind of um, as we're executing this from a remote perspective, I, I guess I should have started there. This is a remote Java client talking to a server executing these commands. Um, we'll execute it in one stage. Um, and we'll execute it serially. I believe that's all we want right now. And so what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and step through and execute these and just give us a result. Um, one thing I've done is slowed down the Docker image network to have a 250 second delay per message. And you'll see it took a little bit of time there to complete. 
there was 22 messages that have to be sent because there were 22 operations total, you know, seven plus eight plus four plus three. Um, so that's you know, divided by four, that's about five seconds. I'll run it again just so you can see there's a delay here of about five seconds for this. So the nice thing about uh, batch mode is you can do all this in one step, in one message. So when I change over to batch mode, it's exactly the same logic right here that we've already written, um, just going to be executed uh, in one message. So there we go. We've got our four exports um, in one message. Now, the bad thing about batching is if there is an error in your code, it is hard to see where that error comes from. So I'm going to intentionally introduce an error here with this error flag. We're going to be executing stuff and, and boom. Since I'm doing in batch, we don't have good line numbers um, natively. Um, if we jump over to serial mode, um, you will see that we do have a good stack trace. Take a second because it is uh, queuing it up. So there we go. So now we can go right here and it's saying, oh, our stack trace is saying we have a bad column right here. So that's why serial is useful. But it would be really useful if we could get line numbers with batching. And that's one of the features that I've worked on this week. So if I add line numbers right here, and we're going to be executing in batch mode, and go ahead and execute in batch, and now we get the batch line number stuff. So you can see it's pointing us to that same line number right there. Mm -hmm. um, just to uh, demonstrate kind of the same logic put together in a slightly different way, we can execute this logic instead of instead of, let's say, executing all in one step, let's say we actually wanted to execute this in four stages um, and get our handles and then print out the handles as soon as we got them. Again, this is exactly the same logic right here. We're not rewriting code. Uh, we're just uh, recombining how we put it together. Uh, we can go ahead and do that. Um, so we'll get rid of this one stage line. Um, and you'll see we're doing it in four stages now. And if we do it, um, four stages with serial. Um, you'll see it's happening stage by stage now. Um, so that is some of the stuff that I've been working on this week. All right, cool. Uh, any questions for Devin? Okay. Um, Colin, are you ready yet, or do you want me to go? Yeah, first? I'm ready. You ready? Okay, how about you go ahead? So last week I talked a little about um, some of the changes about flight uh, so that we can look a little more like that. I am trying to find the screen that I'm sharing now. There we go. It's this one. So this is, uh, and then we did some CSV uh, upload for that. We didn't have download working. So this is now a quick demonstration of CSV upload and download, and we're all using the new flight um, or the new barrage. That way it looks like flight to any other flight client. So that uh, not only new stuff like what Devin, Devin demonstrated, um, but other existing flight clients can all speak uh, our stuff with. So if you make a table that does some things, uh, timestamp doesn't work right now. Um, we've got an issue filed for that to follow up later. Uh, time zone is complicated. I've got to rebuild what enterprise does a little bit differently to get that working. So we can take our data, we can do whatever we want to with it, say remove uh, these values, and sort by this thing here. And then we can say, okay, give us an easy way to download. Um, I love, by the way, that this uh, row count here does update as mm -hmm. the table ticks. Oh yeah, I didn't know. I didn't notice that until I was actually testing this. Yeah, uh, but it's adding about a hundred rows per second. Yeah. And then once I've got the download, upload it from a file. Sorry, you can't see the pop-up that shows the file. Mm -hmm. And then now we've got a non-ticking version of the same thing. Uh, or that you could bring into a different system, or that you could import data from some other platform, and that we are we can scroll through the whole thing uh, locally. So right on. Eleven thousand rows on it. Cool. And then uh, Nate asked that I demonstrate something else real quick here. That select distinct was not working properly, and now it is. You do your select distinct on whatever columns you've got. It will just give you all those values. Remove some of these. We'll get fewer values. Cool. All right. Uh, a few fixes. Uh, okay. Anything else for Colin? Okay. 
looking good. All right. I think me now. Or was there anyone else that had anything to demo? All right. I'm going to demo the screen. So I'm going to show, I need to stop full screen. So I'm going to show some uh, application mode uh, changes that I've made. So it's loading the it's loading a layout from the server. Well, for, for, sorry, first it loads the layout that the user last had loaded. Um, so if I clear out my current layout, I'm just going to delete it, just so you know. Um, it'll load from the server, and the layout that I've got on the server right now. Oh no. What the heck? I uh, I appear to have broken something. Um, I'll need to fix that, but I guess I'm I'm not going to debug it in front of you guys. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know what I broke. Um, what is that? One sec. I don't know why. Well, I don't know what I broke, so I'm gonna have to debug this and show you guys later. Uh, <laughs> I got something to look into. All right, sorry about that. How do I get back to? And I guess that's it for the demo. I'm just capping it off with another, <laughs> another poor end. But thanks, guys. I'll stop streaming.